Today, I'm joined by Pedro Gonzalez. Uh, he is an associate editor at Chronicles Magazine. Um, he is also a Lincoln Fellow alumnus at the Claremont Institute, um, a Substack owner operator, uh, Tucker Carlson frequenter, um, self hating person of color, Castizo futurist. How does one describe oneself <laughs> nowadays, Pedro? I think. Well, first, thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of the show, uh, as are many of my friends. Uh, I, I think all those things are actually accurate, <laughs> uh, or, or at least uh, I hear them enough that I've internalized them. The, the self-hating aspect of, of it, I get that one pretty often. Not just from libs, by the way, uh, also from conservatives. Whenever I, you know, I, I point out that well. You say that conservative ideas are simply better, GOP ideas are simply better, then why do you need to have all these goofy diversity and inclusion initiatives to make them more palatable to different to different demographics, right? And I mean, I think that's a valid question because what I'm getting at is your ideas suck and you're unoriginal and that's why you have to basically just become the left to, to market the same trash, right? And the response I get usually is that you're a self-hating uh, Latinx person of color. So exactly. <laughs> well, you know, you, you're kind of a, an, an outlier there because you a- appeal to, I mean, not necessarily mainstream conservatism, but what mainstream conservatism is drifting towards. Like you, I feel like you're kind of a, a new breed, a new breed of conservative, or someone associated with conservatism. I don't even know. Would you would you consider yourself a conservative at this point? No, I don't. Uh, I, I'm socially conservative, obviously. If you anybody who reads or follows me knows how I feel about social issues, but if I identify with the political movement of conservatism, no, at some point I did, but no longer. I think it's just pointless to have these debates over what is and is not real conservatism. And when you look back on the history of the conservative movement in the United States, it's actually an almost unbroken record of defeat and reconciliation with the gains that the opposition, the supposed opposition has made in this country. I think it's, it's telling that, you know, you look at Ronald Reagan and so much of the conservative legacy is still built on Reagan and it's all a lie, you know, limited government, uh, limited government uh, opposition to like, woke culture. I mean, Reagan created the MLK holiday. Reagan exploded the size of the federal government. Reagan did all of these things that conservatives claim to stand against, and yet they base their, like, a lot of their legacy on Reaganism, just, just, just to use one example. And no, I have no interest in, in like, lit- relitigating these fights over true and fake conservatism. I think a lot of conservatism is, by the admission of many conservatives, basically just defending right liberalism as opposed to bad left liberalism. And I, I don't care. Uh, I, I want to go in a different direction. I'm not beholden to uh, to true conservatism as an ideology. So, Yeah, and in, in the series of very popular conservative presidents that you don't necessarily uh, appreciate, uh, <laughs> Trump comes to mind as well. You're not uh, a, tr- a Trumpist, a Trumpin, a Trumper? I was. <laughs> this is a Trumpkin, is that what you call me? Oh, no. Uh I, I, I was. I mean, you can go back. This is this is kind of funny because there's like this deep lore that I'm like a, a CIA slash crypto DSA plant. <laughs> right. And uh, but I mean, you can go back to American greatness where I, I got my real start writing in the mainstream. I was writing before that in like student embarrassing student Republican uh, publications um, that I'm glad those things uh, no longer exist because I, I, it was experimental, like trying out. That sounds worse than it should, uh, but but you know, playing with conservative ideas basically. Uh, but I really kind of broke into the mainstream through American Greatness, which is around the time that I was also writing or I was getting published in like the Daily Caller and the Washington Examiner. But you can go back at American Greatness and see my my original articles from like 2018, I think, 2017, 2018, and it's like turbo Trump boosterism. You know, the, the zealotry of a convert is on full display in those articles. But at some point, I just realized that I couldn't lie to myself about because I I would catch myself defending like just mistakes that Trump would make or things that just wouldn't happen that he said would. And at some point, I just uh, I wrote an article about how Trump was betraying the working class 
through immigration policy. And it wasn't like, um, I didn't do it self-consciously, you know, turning against Trump. I was just like, I don't, can I swear on your podcast? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just was like, this is bullshit. Like this, he's lying to his base. Uh, and I, I can't lie to myself. So I wrote an article. I think the headline is something like Trump is portraying the working class. And I heard from people that work in immigration restrictionist think tanks that the, 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 the impression was kind of like, finally, someone on the right is saying this. And that was a kind of like, that was the beginning for me of, of kind of re- reassessing, you know, what was actually going on in the administration and looking at the difference between the disconnect between what is said and what is done. And so that's, that kind of took me down the road of like digging into guys like Jared Kushner and Brooke Rollins and all of these people in the administration who systematically undermine the agenda at the same time that Trump was publicly saying everything's fine. Privately, he's actually complaining about these people and still acquiescing to them for some inexplicable reason. Uh, but it, it's funny because privately he was basically saying what I was saying, like this, this stuff is not going to pay off. It's stupid, but you can go along with it. There are many um, theories about uh, why Trump was so ineffective. I think that the, the main kind of unifying theory in, on the dissident right is that, you know, this kind of cathedral conspiracy, the idea that Republicans cannot be, you know, you cannot have two regimes within one regime. You're not going to be, you know, creating actual change within within the system because the system is not yours to change. So do you think that that was part of it or, you know, was it essentially just, uh, yeah, different interests pulling on Trump that, that shouldn't shouldn't have been there? Both. I think it's certainly a combination of both. I, I, I rarely ever take a single convenient explanation for anything. I think it's, it's always a combination of different factors. And I think there's no, there's no question that Trump had a whole array of powerful forces uh, in different sectors of government and the economy and just of, of political life pulling against him. But it didn't help that his administration was filled with these people who fundamentally did not agree with the mandate that voters gave him in 2016. So it's kind of like you're up against the world and then you surround, your lieutenants are all scumbags who don't really care about the mandate and inst- about winning the war, in other words, uh, instead they care about their own little grift, their own uh, little empire within this administration and carving out as much as they can before it ends. That, that was really the mentality for a lot of these people. Uh, and the mentality for getting reelected was not like, you know, the second administration will be based. Uh, it was more of like, how can we, we can, how can we increase our grift? How can we profit more? During the second administration, how can we push our like inane little pet projects uh, harder during the second administration? You're, I mean, the, the most obvious example of this is stuff like the Platinum Plan. You're already hearing about basically a second, even harder push in the second term for criminal justice reform. People have forgotten about this, but it, the writing was on the wall. Trump uh, publicly flubbing to reporters about how amnesty is on the table for DACA recipients in the second administration and then like the damage control coming out of the White House saying, no, 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 that was that was just a, a flub. And it's like, no, no, it's not. I, you know, that, that was actually being considered for the second term. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the cathedral theory is correct, uh, basically, that, that Trump was up against all of these different powerful things, but it didn't help, like I said, who he who he chose as his lieutenants. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be, uh, you know, a, a major ingredient in it. And though there were a few political appointees, I mean, the, the, just the previous guest that I had on, um, you know, uh, Amanda Millius kind of had the same position, you know, that it's both that, you know, there is um, there's a bit of power that you can exercise in there, but you would essentially have to change out every every position and no one had the the, the, the nerve to do that. Right. I mean, this is the, the critique of conservatives. Uh, against Obama is that he governed by pen and phone. I wish that we would. You know, Obama remade the government and his image. Why don't we? Uh, R- Richard Hanania published a study that found, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and will probably butcher the, the synopsis, but basically the gist of it was that Republican presidents tend to appoint fewer Republican nominees to different positions of government compared to Democrats. It's like, 80% or 90% of Obama appointees were, were Democrats. 
uh, versus like a far, far fewer number of those are Republicans under Trump. Why is that? Why do we do that to ourselves? I, I just, this is another reason why I'm not a conservative. Uh, because, I mean, Republicans would tell you that they appreciate a diversity of views or whatever or something like that. Uh, but that's why they lose. <laughs> so, Exactly. I think Hanania's point would be that there are not enough smart conservatives. Right. Very, very brutal. Yeah. Well, I mean, his, I think in that same article, he wrote that uh, liberals plainly care more about political engagement than conservatives. And I mean, this is... You, you hear this in a kind of meme form when, when uh, not so much anymore these days, um, but you used to hear this more where we would ask ourselves, well, why don't we protest the way that BLM does? And I'm not saying go burn down at Wendy's, but why don't we take to the streets you know, and, and rally for people that get railroaded by the criminal justice system because they happen to be white or something? Like Kyle, almost happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. It did happen to Jake Gardner in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, why don't we protest? And the, the contemptuous response from conservatives is, well, because we have jobs and families. We don't have time for that nonsense. It's like, well, that's why you lose. But like I said, it's changing because now the right, not the left, is celebrating these, these protests in Canada where truckers are putting the fear of God into Justin Trudeau and the, the bug man regime. Uh, now, now we're all for it, which is good because you see how effective these things actually can be. But I think Richard's point is still it's still true, and I think it's hopefully won't be as true uh, for much longer. But basically, that liberals uh, care more; they're simply more engaged and more concerned with capturing institutions and then filling them with their with their friends. Yeah, I think that's also kind of the, the main distinction between progressive liberalism and, and right liberalism, because essentially right liberalism is is live and, live and let live. You know, people want to be left alone. Uh, that is just game theoretically the, the dumbest position if you have an aggressive opponent. You know, yeah. you will be stomped on as we are. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, I don't know, a very weird thing. And I, I think that's essentially what we see on the dissident right. I feel like the dissident right is essentially the death of fusionism uh, and the death of, of libertarianism as well. Like people you have played out this, the, the, the ideas. I mean, what's this going to look like if no one exercises power on the right? Uh, and it doesn't look good. <laughs> it's really, it doesn't look good. No, that's totally right. I think uh, a concept that comes to mind is the tyranny of values. And I was, I was actually just reading this before we started recording. Uh, it was an essay or lecture by Carl Schmitt and basically the gist of it is exactly that, that under liberalism, the, the enmity of these conflicting values is kind of hidden from view because we refer to them as standpoints. You know, this is just my perspective, man, the right liberal says, and I respect your perspective and I'll die for your right to, you know, to kill me with it. But Schmidt says, like, just the fact that we refer to them as euphemisms, uh, like standpoint, perspective you know, my opinion, uh, that actually conceals the enmity that is there. We're not talking about disagreements over like tax rates, you know, uh, something that, that trivial, petty. We're talking about can men be men and women be, or can men be women and can women be men? We're talking about whether nations should exist. Forget borders. You know, I remember this article by the New York Times a few years ago saying that the, the nation state is a thing of the past. And, you know, it's kind of just skipping borders are bad, going straight to we should just get rid of the nation state altogether. Like these are not small disagreements uh, and, and you can't ultimately coexist with these people. The only thing you can really do is just like I've been saying on Twitter, uh, margin, and this is my writing is informed by this philosophy, is marginalize these people politically so that they can't hurt you and the people that you care about. That's it. Uh, there, there is no neutral space with people like there's neutral space between people like you and I. Because we agree a lot on the fundamental things, but not with other, not with the the people that I'm talking about who have these deep civilizational disagreements. Right? Uh, that's not that's not a, a mere disagreement of perspective anymore. And and, and the trick they pull is to um, brand whatever worldview they have as common sense and a science, obviously, which is kind of the the, the bigger argument right now. And for them, you know, co contrasting like a 
you know, conservative lifestyle or something like that with, with whatever progress has in store just is the difference between the past and the glorious future. And it's really clear that you and me, we're, we're I mean, retrograde. We're, we're dumb because, you know, we, there's no reason to, to believe these things if you believe in, in progress. No, that's exactly right. It, that's exactly right. We are atavistic. Uh, we're relics of the past. Uh, but that's why I've I've embraced terms like atavism. Like I think I think atavism is healthy to a degree. But I think getting to the point of science, uh, even this, uh, e- even science has been imbued because so, science is supposed to be value free, right? Well, in our time, even science is imbued with value by the how do we refer to them as uh, libs? Let's just call them libs because it's kind of uh, degrading in a way. Uh, so. The libs uh, who are in these positions, uh, the overseers of official science, like they they don't really hide the fact that uh, that their values are kind of uh, imbued into into I guess the scientific process. And so, okay, let's give an example. There's an article in Science Magazine, uh, I think published January 20th, really recent. It's remarkable that uh, this hasn't caused more of a stir, but basically the article is about how uh, there are a lot of people. They try to downplay it, but it's like you, the headline and the, like the lead are, uh, are kind of like it minimizes the content of what's what in the article. Basically, there are a lot of people who have never had COVID and are vaccinated and have uh, are experiencing symptoms that are like long COVID, uh, debilitating. Again, this is in Science Magazine, so I hope YouTube doesn't strike your video from from. The platform, but this is in Science Magazine, and you know they qualified a lot, but they admit there are people that have basically debilitating symptoms, like people that cannot pick up their children, uh, and if, and they get tested, it's not COVID, and the only conclusion is is that it's a uh, it's a side effect of vaccines, and some of these people got tested by the NIH, the NIH basically collected their data and then abandoned them, and then these people were basically told go to your local physician. And what they're saying is, is no one wants to touch us because we're not supposed to exist. That that people like us who have these horrific side effects, we're, we're invisible because the scientific community wants nothing to do with us. It, it just it it goes against you know their values to to acknowledge the existence of people like us. And one woman even said that originally I was hesitant to come forward and talk about my symptoms because I didn't want to cause vaccine hesitancy. It's totally insane, and it just shows that you know the the slogans of trust the data or it's science. It's like it's it's a com- it completely again it hides it hides the values that are behind this. Yeah, and and it hides the fact that you know the data itself, you know the the way it's collected, the way it's interpreted, the way you know p hacking, all of this type of stuff is is based on the values. Even when you're doing a study, you have kind of a prior value in mind of what you're looking to, to get. And you have a data set and then you test and every hypothesis under the sun on, on that data set and one of them reaches significance levels and then you publish that. That's just how science works. And obviously you only like your hypotheses, but what you mentioned, this, you know, this situation, I mean, it's happened in my family. Like my mom is like that. She had her Moderna booster and she is just absolutely out of she has she has like like galloping arthritis um and it's in every joint and it just it was like days after getting the booster obviously this does not mean that you know correlation does not cause you know it's not causation but it's really shocking how fast everything everything rolled in and i think she she's one of these people and she went to the to two doctors now rheumatologists and the only you know, conclusion they have is that she has arthritis, which was pretty clear to us as well. Right. Yes. Uh, but like, thank you, doctor. So suddenly, like she's she's like she just turned sixty. It's it's you know, she, and she has the disease of someone who's eighty five. So I don't know. Very, I don't know. I'm not gonna. You know, I'm not a doctor, but still. There was one person who said that he went to the uh, to the NIH, uh, and then eventually, I can't remember his name, but he's he's one of the heads at the NIH, or he might be the head. Um, but he, he actually told one of the main women who was interviewed, stop sending me new patients and then just stopped returning people's emails. And then just, like I said, directed them to local physicians. One person who commented in this story, uh, they remained anonymous, but they said that, uh, they knew someone who was part of this, this group, 
uh, that was experiencing side effects who was diagnosed with anxiety. It was a woman. And I thought about how in the past, you know, that's actually something doctors would do. They would diagnose women with hysteria, which may or may not be true in some case. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, but, but this, but I mean, this is, this is what the doctor said. Like, no, you're just, you're just hysterical. This is anxiety. Like your side effects are, your, your side effects are literally not happening because they can happen. Terrible as the, these stories are, they're not really all that new to me because I've been reporting on, um, gosh, what's it called? R recidivism rates. So I wrote an article for Chronicles magazine a year or two ago about recidivism and how like these studies will show, well, look, our, our soft on crime policies are working because when we, when we release people from prison, they don't, uh, they don't commit crimes again. They don't recidivate. And I, I spoke to actual prosecutors in Ohio and they, they explained how these recidivism rates, although they are presented to you in PDF form with like an official stamp and it shows, you know, recidivism, recidivism rates are going down in Ohio, whatever. It was explained to me that basically, if you get out of prison in a certain area, go across the state line to like Michigan and commit a crime, as far as Ohio is concerned, you didn't recidivate mm. because the crime did not happen within a designated area. And so you're to Ohio, to the Ohio Department of Corrections, you're a success story. So again, uh, when you, you, you enter this debate, you'll hear, we'll trust the data. These policies are working. Recidiv recidivism rates are down. Can't you see? Like so th so these people that were released within this certain period of time did not recidivate. But of course they did. They just did it outside of the, the parameters of, of how this data is actually collected and turned into, into information that we then base our policy decisions on and arrange our society on. It's a, it's a gigantic civilizational grift. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. You know, essentially that's kind of the, the Steven Pinker uh, idea that, you know, we're, we're slowly gliding towards progress, but who's, who's doing these statistics? Like, I want to see where your data is coming from, yeah. man. Cause yeah. there's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, one, one of your major topics um, and the one you probably get most pushback on because of your last name, I guess, uh, is immigration. You mentioned that before. Um, I mean, what, why is immigration the number one? I think, at least to me, it feels like, you know, the, the, one of the, the, the main concerns for, for everyone in the, in the U.S. Like, why do you think it, it should be a top concern? I think when we're talking about immigration, we're, we're ultimately talking about the character of the nation. And whether or not it will continue existing in its current form or closer to its original form than not. Why does that matter? Well, because if you change the character of a country, of a nation, you change its political system. It's the simplest way to put all of this, that if you change the, the people that are actually operating within the political system, those people are probably going to have an effect on that system. and take it in a different direction. And I think you see this if you look at preferences for things like censorship, like which groups are more likely to favor policies that would punish what they consider hate speech. It's mostly non-whites. Uh, I'm, I'm ashamed to say this, but it's, it's like Hispanics favor uh, these kinds of laws more than their white counterparts. But that is a very obvious example of what I mean by changing a political system. Same thing with gun control. Uh, and obviously, free speech to a degree, I'm not talking about license, but free speech and the right to bear arms, these are, these are American traditions, right? Well, again, the groups that are more likely to embrace gun control or want policies for gun control, they're, we'll call them recent arrivals or more recent arrivals, the post-1965 people. That's just a fact. Uh, and again, I think it's striking for people that I write about this stuff because of my background, I think. That's mostly why. But I don't care. I'm, I'm interested in the truth, right? I'm, I'm interested in uh, what is and is not uh, actually happening. And when you look at the facts, this is just the case. And we can either lie to ourselves about it. Uh, we can reconcile ourselves to it, which is what a lot of conservatives actually do. Uh, a lot of conservatives either lie to themselves about about these realities or they just kind of accept like, well, it, it's very progressive in a way, right? Like this is just demographics is destiny, man. Just, I mean, that's true. Uh, but it's disgusting because they continue claiming to be like, you know, patriotic people, but they're not. So 
in a nutshell, that's why. I think it, it's a it's really a kind of existential question, immigration. Um, and what what can be done about it? I'm, I'm not sure. And that's not to say that, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm living proof that there are exceptions to the rule, but there are rules. Yeah. Yeah, good a good way to to put it. Um I, I completely mirror your um your commitment to to truth. At least that's what I I tell myself that I'm doing because a lot of people ask me like, you know, what are you doing in these circles and these like misogynistic, you know, hell holes with all these people, you know, picking on women. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> it's you know, it's I've I've found more truth in these corners than anywhere else that I've been. And it might sometimes be harsh truths about, you know, people that are very similar to me and I just I just accept them. I don't accept everything, obviously. And I try to, you know, there's just some there's some things that are a bit too extreme, but I think there's just quite a lot a lot in it. Yeah. So I, I I should add that I've I've kind of taken a cheeky twist on the whole demographics is destiny thing because I've actually used this to explain why uh, Latino men really like Donald Trump, specifically Latino men, why they seem to to flock to him, although he obviously had hardline rhetoric on immigration. And you know, you if you're like a lib journo, you would think that Trump is repugnant to people like me. And yet a lot of Hispan a lot of brown men really like him. And my thesis is basically the Cadillo thesis, like the strongman thesis, that that uh that brown men with a he- a healthy sense of atavism respect strength and respect power and machismo. And so this is where I've kind of turned demographics as destiny on its head and said, like, if if libs are afraid of the rising tide of of uh strongman politics of right populism you have no one to blame but yourselves this is what this is what uh diversity looks like now i i hope that my fellow co-ethnics make me proud and actually do contribute to overthrowing the bugman regime politically i, I don't know um but i mean this is the, the trends are there you know a, trump seems to have made a good impression on a lot of brown on a lot of brown men and i think it's specifically for that reason. And even like the New York Times, it was interesting. It was like uh, this, one of the reporters was reading me after I published one or two articles on my whole Cadillo theory, uh, the New York Times read an article and they did it. They made the same uh, points, but it was bad. Like, well, you know, there's a lot of misogyny in the Latino community. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, colorism in the Latino community. Uh, There's a lot of like basically unhealthy male things in the latino community that makes them kind of vulnerable to to and that's why we have to you know uh work harder to to uh, homogenize latinos into just the to the latinx voting block yeah to 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 bring them to our level of uh, testosterone (laughs) yeah um one one event that that happened recently and i thought was uh, quite fascinating involved you you were at the center of a, a a scandal um, and uh, actually a, t- a takedown attempt um, by none other than Douglas Murray accusing you of, of the worst thing that one can be accused of, of yeah. anti-Semitism. Um, and it seems to, you know, like like water off a duck's back. You're still here. You have not been obliterated by the, uh, you know, by this uh, accusation. How, how did you manage, you know? Uh, I, I have good friends uh, that that know, that stood up for me I, because I honestly, it was disgusting. The attack was disgusting, but then it, how he tried to kind of walk it back mm-hmm. and and kind of play it off. If you want to have still have a job, yeah, and like let that be a lesson to you, kind of a tone. Uh, but I know that you allowed me. I'm, I try to like I I actually have quite a potty mouth. I try to keep it PG on podcasts and obviously on television, but it's hard right now. Uh, <laughs> Murray, um, he explicitly called for my defenestration, which is to throw someone out a window. And, and what he meant by that was like, com- just completely cast out, turn this person into a pariah, fire him, don't give him a platform, forget he exists, excommunicate him. That's how he ends his article, which he built around two mean tweets, which is especially hilarious considering that he's made his little career on uh, de- decrying left wokeism and cancel culture and unreason. And then he built an argument hysterically based on two mean tweets that I made. And he read into them anti-Semitism and then concludes, you need to destroy this person's life. Mm -hmm. And then it backfires because like I said, I I kind of allowed other people to defend me. I mean, 
a lot of these, these are, I think I'm talking about this now and I'm, I'm happy to talk about it now because I think, uh, these these attacks are designed to destroy people and they often work by setting traps uh and i think the expectation was that i would read it go off because i can be a bit of a hothead and then basically dig a hole for myself and i didn't i uh initially my response was like this is stupid i'm going to ignore it but then i i saw that there was a kind of coordinated effort and i mean i'll get to this to to kind of amplify it and that, that's when people started to contact me about it and say, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And without me actually really asking, I, I don't think I asked anybody to defend me. People just started doing it. And um, that's not to say that I wouldn't have asked. I'm not like, I'm not trying to beat my chest about how brave I am, but I'm just saying like, this is how appreciative I have of my friends that without even me asking, they stepped in and said, this, this attack is bullshit. Douglas Murray is, is a fraud and all this stuff. I had a lot of I had a lot of Jewish friends like David uh, David Goldman who's I don't he's I I only just met him through this but uh, he he was like one of the most brutal uh, critics of Douglas Murray for writing this basically he said like Jews can take care of this themselves like your help is not needed and so it was it was hilarious to see how ferociously it backfired on him but that's my advice to people is like do that, like allow your friends to defend you and don't fall into the traps that these people set for you. Because I, that, I really think that's what it was about. Um, but anyways, he, he responded after it back, after it blew up on him, uh, basically by saying like, you know, we'll let that be like, I'm going to let you off with a spanking and a warning, which did actually, uh, that did actually make me really angry because it's like, cause you're now he's just saving face like this. You tried to get me fired and destroyed it blew up in your face and now you're trying to play it off. Like this was all part of the plan just to kind of scare me. And, uh, and then, but after that, he writes this article on unheard and kind of does the same thing, but more broadly to the conservative movement, but sorry, going back to your question, how did I survive it? And I think it's just because there seems to be a network now of people who are really sick and tired of punching right. And that network has stepped in to defend people like me. I'm not. I'm not saying there's not actually there's not literally a network. I hope that no one watches this and thinks that there's like a like a shadowy cabal in the background that's protecting me. But I just mean there's like a like a network of influencers who get along, who are on the right, and when they see someone like me get attacked, they all kind of step in to to defend that person. Because this also happened to uh, Patrick Deneen, I think in September, and then Elijah Schaefer also got hit like right after I did. It was crazy. It was like an epidemic of anti-Semitism charges against people on the right. And in every case they failed uh, because people were willing to say like, this is bullshit. Like this is a, a clear attempt at character assassination. So it's just, I think what made the Murray thing kind of take people back for a second was the fact that it came from the right uh, kind of, and that it came from a guy who is, who has a pretty big profile. And so you would expect someone like that to be able to take someone like me out, but it didn't. So, yeah, it's, I, I feel like at least from, from my perspective, this has been like a very um, good event to show that there are people on the right who are not necessarily playing into the framing of the left anymore. Yeah. Um, like this, this, I mean, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, it would have been, you know, just a, a nuclear accusation um, because everyone on the right was still essentially playing who who's the real racist here, you know, oh, the Democrats are the real racist, you know, all, all that type of stuff. There is a group of people who are not playing who are the real racist anymore. And uh, it, that's essentially the only way to to win. And you're doing that and you're doing it very fairly and you've called someone Jewish ugly and, you know, you live to see another day, which is incredible. So yeah, I think it's, it's very heartening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there's, uh, that that's that was a point that David Goldman made. Uh, he's if you don't know who Goldman Goldman is he's a, a columnist for the Age of Times and he wrote under the pen name Spangler for a while. But I saw that he commented on Murray's tweet about my article. He, he actually wrote a few comments. The first one was he actually looked at like the history of my my physiognomy checks and and said like Pedro doesn't discriminate like he's an equal opportunity checker against you know everybody uh and then another comment was like so are you saying that you know we can't talk about goblins anymore because that's implicitly uh anti-jewish 
You know, like all of just like it. I think that's part of the reason why it blew up on Murray was that it was so stupid and just hysterical. And again, he's supposed to be this really erudite, serious person, but I think it revealed that he's a fraud. I, it's weird to say this again because you know he's 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 an, uh, an author who's successful. Uh, he gets invited to conferences to give talks and stuff, but I mean, it's one of these things where you just look a little bit beneath the surface and. He's just a, he's just a lib. Uh, yeah. He's, he's a lib. I, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like Douglas's books. I think, you know, they're, they're quite red pilling if you, if you look at them, but the, the way he frames things, it's, you know, the, the mysterious X of Y, the strange death of X. It's like, don't, you know, here is the very poetically laid out disaster we are in, but don't you come up with any solutions. It's all very strange. It's mysterious. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I wrote uh, an editorial in Chronicles that's coming out in the next few days, uh, responding to his article in Unheard. Because after he tries to take me out, he then talks about it's. Uh, you have to read it. It's like you can't tell if if if, if this is satire or not. Are you satirizing yourself or is this real? But he begins by saying that he was invited to the National Conservatism Conference, although he only agreed with one third of the agenda, and he humbly declined an offer to be a speaker, uh, but instead blessed the audience as a panelist. And and it's while he's sitting to he's sitting there listening to Patrick Deneen talk that he realizes he actually I'm not I'm not even like caric- making a caricature of the tone. This is actually the tone in which it's written. That while listening to Patrick Deneen, he finds himself in considerable disagreement with pretty much everything he says and realizes that this is why in a million years, people like Bill Maher and Barry Weiss would never identify as conservative. And he goes on to list a, a kind of like crimes that conservatives have committed that have offended the, the reasonable libs like Bill Maher and Barry Weiss. Basically, everything that makes the right the right, like its affinity for religion, its pro-life values, uh, it, it's... And sense of traditionalism, like all of these things for Murray, it's, the religion is a big one for Murray. He's an atheist. Uh, all these things are based for him, the things that make the right repugnant to otherwise reasonable li- liberals like Bill Maher, who actually once said that for mankind to live, religion must die. So uh, we have to accommodate that. And and I noticed that like one or two graphs down after he introduces Deneen as the kind of foil of his article, he says, well, you know, is it any wonder why these libs don't come over. Uh, it, maybe it has something to do with the kind of conservatives they'd have to associate with. It's like, this seems to be his self-appointed role is declaring who can and cannot be associated with, who is and is not, you know, palatable. Uh, and, and we have to listen to him because we need people like Murray to win, which is totally not true. Um, but yeah, I think that article actually had a very similar effect as his attack on me. Like a lot of people read it and were shocked at how badly argued it was and how re- absurd it was. Like your problem with the right is that it's not the left yeah, is what you're saying. So yeah, yeah. but Murray's just one part of this whole like intellectual dork web, uh, non-woke liberals uh, cohort that is trying to like basically purge people from conservative or right-wing circles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's been quite a lot of friction lately between the yeah, like kind of core IDW, um, which has a role. I think a lot of people who ended up on on this side, you know, came through those channels. You know, I used to be a big Jordan Peterson stan, gave me a lot of energy, I you know, very much. Um, but I think they serve the purpose and then there's there's a new thing and i i hope to say that this is the new thing it feels like you know there's there's more energy here just because there are questions that the idw proper cannot answer or they refuse to answer or they defenestrate you if you attempt to answer yep yep that's right no i look i wrote an article in the spectator unfortunately the spectator's editor uh dominic green dogpiled me he, he actually rep he shared um, Douglas, Murray, Jerry's, uh, Douglas Murray's article about me and uh, quoted the part where Murray references me by name. Mm-hmm. That, so that was disappointing because I don't think I'm going to be writing for The Spectator anytime soon. Um, but I wrote a bunch of articles for them that did well. And one of them was a piece about uh, Claire Lehman, I think, and the IDW and the problem with this, this whole idea of an IDW and what they do, more importantly. 
And in that article, I actually concluded by saying the same thing you just said, like these people do serve a purpose. Uh, Jordan Peterson has done a lot of good by introducing a generation of young people to concepts like hierarchy and more importantly, defending why hierarchies are both inevitable and, and in many ways healthy. So yeah, they have a role. Absolutely. And I think they're not all the same. I think Claire is insane. And like, if she's not like a bad actor, someone should pay her to be a bad actor because, you know, like, I don't know if you, if you look at her Twitter feed and she'll just say like the dumbest things, like the right complains about how it doesn't have institutional power, but they have tons of YouTube channels. Checkmate. Like that, that's, those are her takes. Like those are really her takes. You know, or like the right complains that it doesn't have the power, uh, but in America they have the Second Amendment, and then like you know, like with an emoji of someone laughing, like that. that this is you know an, an intellectual powerhouse with the IDW, with these horrible takes. But I think the 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 issue is like you said, if they were just kind of like there to act as a kind of gateway, fine. The problem is is that once you get through the gateway, or if you try to get through, they will snipe at you and try to take like the the basis for that article i wrote about claire was actually because she attacked james Lindsay for talking about white genocide and and saying he made some argument that was kind of consistent with the whole theory of like discrimination against white people as, as policy right or as a cultural phenomenon and claire actually attacked him for saying that he was peddling baseless white repl- uh, white genocide conspiracy theories so it was actually a perfect example, and and it began with a kind of intra movement fight. Yeah, yeah, and I've had my own fight with James Lindsay, who <laughs> I know. I I think I was I think I even said like I can't believe I'm defending James Lindsay, but he's on the right side here. <laughs> yeah, you know, it seems like I'm I'm on the extreme right. <laughs> so, you know, if if I'm being gatekept by the guy who's being gatekept by the center or whatever the the, the thinking man's uh, magazine, then uh, I must be doing something very wrong. <laughs> Um, uh, I wanted to ask you about, you know, because we were talking about Trump, uh, you are not pro-Trump anymore, but do you think that he was kind of a, a, a you know, an IDW, you know, a necessary catalyst yes, yeah. for someone like DeSantis or, you know, the, the new figures on the right? No, I think, um, I think I, I spent so much time trying to expose like what went wrong with the Trump administration and like. Trump's personal character flaws that injured his own mandate and his own movement, that the, th- this part of what I always say gets muted out, which is that Trump was a catalyst. Without him, I don't think we would be having this discussion right now, for which I'm grateful. I just wish that he would be able to, and this, is, I mean, this, is a, this goes back to why his administration was such a mess, I wish that he would just be able to subdue his ego and you know, realize that there's a lot more at stake than uh, how the media is talking about you uh, or how you feel. Because if you, I mean, this is totally true. You always hear these reports about how Trump is angry, that DeSantis is kind of like hogging the limelight, or that he's angry that people are not talking about him during a certain period of time that he thinks is unacceptable. Like, that's act- this is true. That's actually how he is. Like, he's, his, his whole life has been him demanding the spotlight which is fine for an entertainer, but not for a leader of a political movement uh, when you're having like a regime level crisis. So I think that he has a role to play and his, just his endorsements are really powerful. But I, I, I say that because you just saw how he just made an endorsement based off of just whim. I mean, it's not whim, there's more there, but he made an endorsement that was totally disconnected from the mandate that he claims to represent and the result was it is that it pissed off his base. I'm talking about Morgan Ortegas. This is his most recent endorse, endorsement. Uh, I don't have a dog in the race between uh, whether Robbie Starbuck or Morgan Ortegas gets the endorsement, but it infuriated people because it's like Morgan is a dyed in the wool neoconservative. She she was created by Pompeo in the Trump administration. She like all the people that I've spoken to. I mean, you can ask Amanda Milius what she thinks of her. It was interesting to see. So many people get angry at Trump over this. And again, that's actually one of the best examples of what I mean, that he's just a creature of ego, which can be good to an extent because it makes him very charismatic. But again, we're not fighting over like TV ratings or uh, the meme wars are funny to an extent. But then when these people come for your kids, when they lock you in your house, it stops being funny. 
So, so, but, but that being said, I totally agree. And I will never stop saying this. Trump was a catalyst without him. We would not be having this discussion. Yeah. And uh, and neoconservatives, you do uh, tend to have a bone to, bone to pick with them. Uh, Douglas Murray wrote a book uh, about, I think it was neoconservatism, why it's needed, why it's a thing or something like that. Um, what What is wrong with the neoconservatives? <sighs> Everything. What isn't wrong with them? No, there, there's, I will say that the original neocons, the, the so-called paleo neoconservatives, they were at least more socially conservative and much more cerebral. The worst thing they ever did was reproduce and give us Bill Crystal and uh, John Potteritz. Uh, and then those that like that movement really spawned a political catastrophe in the United States. Ironically, Francis Fukuyama, who's now beating the drum about how the United States like should confront Russia, once denounced neoconservatives. He broke with them because he, he compared them to Leninists. Uh, who believed that with just enough application of power and will, history could be moved along its track. And that becomes the basis for democratizing the world by force, right? And and so he said something to the effect of Bolshevism was tried in the Soviet Union and it has reemerged in the United States as false. That's how he described neoconservatism. And apart from their horrific foreign policy views, they also kind of pioneered this tactic of helping to purge the right of people that they just consider, uh, you know, not palatable. Uh, often with many of the same slanders that you you see, like I mean, look at David French for for a, a live action example of what neoconservatism is about. Look at Dave, look at guys like David French, Jonah Goldberg, Bill Kristol. I don't need to actually make a, a sustained argument against neoconservatism. I can actually just show you a picture of David French and say, like, <laughs> this is what's wrong. This is your stick. Yeah, but they're unre- and they're totally unrepentant. Uh, the, the only problem is, is that we didn't listen to them enough. You know, uh, we, we didn't uh, go along uh, more, more closely with the neoconservative platform. Uh, look at Bill Crystal today, and he's, he's having conversations with with like CRT scholars, this is a fairly recent conversation he had. Uh, and he was basically talking about how like CRT is totally justified because we need to have a discussion about race in this country. This is like a, a major error to neoconservatism. D- David French, same exact thing. David French has also been saying like the efforts to ban CRT are wrong because at any rate, America is racist. We need to talk about it. This, this is actually the function. They're kind of like the original gatekeepers, or at least they were very good at it. And the problem is because people will say to me, well, you know, why do you care so much about them? They're out of the picture. They're not. They've, they've just managed to reinvent themselves. Like Bill Crystal has reinvented himself as a Democrat. David French kind of, he's like on the fence uh, almost, but he, he's going in that same direction, you know, kind of appealing to libs. In other words, uh, a, a lot of other neoconservatives have reinvented themselves as America first people. Trump hired John Bolton. Mike Pompeo is now a star of the MAGA movement, you know, like, it, they're just really good at kind of uh, lying low and then just kind of you know reemerging uh, with with a new coat of paint. So, yeah, I mean they're, tip- I mean they don't seem very distinguishable from from liberals except for the fact that people know them as conservatives. Like there's quite an army of them that are like conservative in, no- in name only. Yeah, well, I think the the main problem with neoconservatism, specifically of the more right wing variety like Pompeo, Bolton. Uh, these people, um, because they think these people are actually a, a much bigger threat to people like us than Bill Crystal, um, because no one on our side is really listening to Bill Crystal anymore. Bill Crystal is just collecting a paycheck by saying what people at the Washington Post say. Uh, that's that's his audience. And same thing with David French. That's why you know, as, as we can make fun of them and like dunk on them, and I do as much as we want, and it just it bounces off their heads because they actually don't care what people to their right say, because they're, you're not their audience. Why would they care? So the real threat comes from guys like Pompeo, Bolton, and and all their little, pro- not, not, not Bolton, obviously not anymore, but let's say, let's focus on like Pompeo and like Rick Grinnell. The real threat comes from these people because again, they reinvent themselves as like MAGA. And I think that the strength of neoconservatism is that it exploits patriotism. It, it exploits the concept of American exceptionalism to justify its agenda and to stigmatize opposition to its aims. 
And right now, when people are so frustrated with Biden, when they feel like the country is being humiliated, that it's in the gutter, that is actually when neoconservatism is liable to experience a resurgence, precisely because of this. Like Biden has allowed Putin to make a joke of America, you know, someone says on Fox News, and then and then suddenly we want like more and more people want to go into a confrontation with Russia. I don't I, I don't think it's uh, I think it's there are obstacles to its resurgence, but I but I hope you see what I mean when I say it. it's always kind of there, precisely because it it latches on to things that are good, like patriotism. Yeah. Um, you, you had a, a recent article about a man um, called Paul Singer. Um, this is a, is, this kind of plays into the, the theme of, uh, of GOP uh, shadow puppeteers. Um, and according to your article, he is the man who um, selected the new CEO of Twitter. Things have changed on Twitter. You know, needless to say, whoever's on Twitter has seen uh, a few changes, uh, a few purges. Um, I mean, uh, how, how does this play into into what's going on on uh, on these platforms. Yeah, well, Singer is a great example because he opposed Trump uh, vehemently originally, and then um, kind of went into Trump world. Uh, and he was he was actually his one of his organizations because he has many of these different little organizations that he that he that he bankrolls. One of them it, uh, it's designed to promote. LGBT stuff within the GOP. Paul Singer, by the way, going going back a little bit further, he, he's a neoconservative GOP mega donor, and he's a hawk on foreign policy and on social issues. Characteristic of many neoconservatives, he's he's more or less, more or less on the left. Like Paul Singer was a huge driver for the GOP embracing same sex marriage. I think it, one of his sons is is gay. I think I'm, I'm not sure if it's. Uh, I think it, I think it is his son. But anyways, so through one of his organizations, uh, his staffers met with uh, Bruce Jenner, Bruce, Caitlyn Jenner. I don't know. Again, I don't know if, if I should censor myself so that you don't get uh, kicked off of YouTube. I don't, but we'll just say Jenner. Depends what, what time they met. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so he, through one of these singer organizations, uh, Jenner, the, the Jenner gubernatorial candidacy was basically conceived. It was seated there. So the the points of contact between Trump world, because Jenner's entire team was composed of Trump people, and, and neoconservative singer world was actually through one of these organizations. Uh, because when I re- published this article, I, I mentioned some of this stuff and the response from people was like, this is just Trump derangement syndrome. There's, there's no connection between neocon, like, Paul Singer and his money and Trump. It's like, no, there is, you're just not looking in the right places. But anyways, my point is, is like, that's, that's how influential these people are. They're everywhere. Uh, whether it's, whether or not it is, or is not MAGA world. And the point that I was making in that article was that uh, w- when you have people like this, that are huge GOP donors, who th- this is who the Republican party actually listens to. Uh, they're more likely to listen to someone like Singer than they are to you. And why is that a problem? Well, Singer is not always doing things that are actually good for the right. And the example I gave was his role in the ouster of Jack Dorsey and the appointment of this new CEO, Parag Agrawal. Uh, and, that, and that's not like a that's not a, a loose connection. His hedge fund, Elliott Management, will spearhead the push to get Dorsey out to put more of its own people on the Twitter board, and then chose this new CEO. So the the argument that I make in there is if, if you don't like the new Twitter censorship regime, and if you don't like the new Twitter CEO, well, you can blame Paul Singer because his hedge fund was directly responsible for this whole thing. And again, uh, these are the people, or Singer is, is the person who is you know behind uh, the, the GOP's actual policy and politics. Singer, by the way, also is connected to Douglas Murray through the Henry Jackson Society. One of the the trustees on that society, one of the members on its leadership board, was a senior portfolio manager at Elliott Management for 11 years until 2019. And so there's there's a lot of overlap, uh, not just in the United States, but, uh, between these groups. So, and that that actually that point. People speculated that you know Paul Singer 
was somehow involved in Douglas Murray writing that article. I don't think so. I think, I think Douglas Murray is just that hysterical and really actually believes what he wrote. So. Yeah. It's a, it, it is an interesting thing. It's a, you know, for example, if you present this, this idea to someone who is, you know, basically Republican, like, you know, the, the, the quintessential boomer con who thinks that there is a friend enemy distinction maybe between the Republicans who are on our side and the, um, the, the liberals who are on their side. And then when you, when you have, you know, when you essentially lay out what you laid out in that article, uh, things get a bit confusing and you have a lot of people who are on the right, but they're, they're very, um, you know, uh, profoundly anti-Republican, like, <laughs> like our friend, uh, Indian Bronson at, at against GOP, or I don't know, maybe he's changed his, <laughs> his Twitter, Twitter alt. Oh, that's right. Yeah. For the longest time, his, his Twitter at was against GOP. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, it does make sense. If you, if you look, if you look underneath the, the first layer of uh, reality, it starts to make more sense. Um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, this new, probably not new uh, phenomenon of, of trans. I mean, you've been pretty outspoken about this as well. Some people don't appreciate you focusing on it, uh, for some reason. Uh, but I think it's, it's, I've, I've also commented on this a a lot. I think it's an extremely important phenomenon because it's, it's probably the, the most flagrant cleavage of, of reality, uh, that we've, we've seen, you know, men becoming women, women becoming men. Um, you know, why, why is this an important narrative shift? The narrative shift as in the normal, the normalization of transgenderism or the opposition to it? Yeah, no, yeah, essentially, essentially the the normalization of transgenderism. I think because what we're what the the or at least the, the thing that I've really taken up against is the fact that this stuff is being mainstreamed to children at record record pace. And I think the obvious problem with this is that what we're telling kids uh, is when they're at their most vulnerable that something terrible happened at birth that they were born in the wrong body. And the only solution for that is for them to basically orient their personality, their being around their sexual identity. Like that is that I, you shouldn't have to explain why that's insane and incredibly dangerous. You're, you're telling a very young person who's still figuring everything out. Actually, you're born in the wrong body. And in order to fix this, you have to, uh, you know, introduce yourself to all this like literature, like gender queer and, and basically kind of fast track uh, your your sexual uh, enlightenment uh, in the most perverse way possible. And so setting like setting that side, and I think a lot of this stuff is uh, you're opening kids up to really, really dangerous things uh, and a predation. I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, then there's obviously the broader issue of, of reality. Uh, we, we're, we're declaring against our own sense that men can simply become women and vice versa. Uh, there, if, if you can't agree on the basis of, of sex, uh, that, that there's more to it than hormones and puberty blockers and, and lipstick and like implants, uh, I think the basis of your very civilization just falls out at that point. Um, and it, we, we laugh about stuff like, you know, transgender, a, a male swimmer who identifies as a woman uh, is beaten by another male swimmer who also identifies as a woman. And like all of the actual female competitors are like left in the dust. We laugh about this stuff. But uh, I mean, this is I think this is just a sign that like kind of everything is falling apart. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. Um, there's, there, I mean, there's a lot here. I, I, and I think it runs up into the, the problem of also like modern feminism. And in some sense, transgenderism is kind of like the realization of modern fem- feminism. Uh, and I know that I have some like turf people that I get along with and they would probably attack me for this, but I think it's true. I mean, it, what we're, we've, we've basically liberated women from the traditional conception of womanhood to the extent that now men can also be women and then beat up uh, physically assault another woman in like a cage fight. And that's progress now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's essentially my, my take on it as well. I mean, feminism is just one, one more flavor of, of 
Millian liberalism where, you know, you're kind of uh, shedding all your humanly bonds to become this ethereal being that can, you know, inhabit the world of, of rationality and, and just choose, 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 choose all, all, all aspects of your life. And I mean, why can't you as a man choose to be a woman or, yeah. or the yeah, universe? That's right. You might hear my, my son. He just woke up from his nap, by the way. For your audience, uh, just, no worries. Just, just so everyone knows. Uh, no, I think I think that's right, and I think that's why. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the 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 transgender question is kind of again, its its significance is is hidden precisely because it's so easily mocked uh, that we don't realize this is actually very grave uh, what we're discussing, and I think there are so many kind of influence or interests at play here. And a, a perfect example of this, I always give this one, is of this father in Seattle, Washington, whose son was autistic. He's a devout Muslim, by the way. Uh, and so his son is autistic. He takes him to the hospital because his son is having an episode. Uh, because of COVID, the father can't stay with the son, so he goes home. A day or two later, he gets a call, probably the next day, gets a call and the hospital says, well, the problem with your son is not that he's autistic, it's that he's a girl. Uh, the social workers have interacted with him and they've determined that your son is actually transgender. And to the father's credit, he stays very calm and he goes along with it because he knows that if he kicks too hard, um, that like CPS will get involved and they'll take his kids. And so he goes along with it, you know, says, tell me what I, what I need to do next. I'll pick my son up and, and we'll start the process of basically turning my son into a girl right away. Takes his son from the hospital, takes his entire family, and they flee Washington state. And so I think there you have three things at play. On the one hand, the pharmaceutical industry uh, that is making tons of money off of the rise of transgender, the normalization of transgenderism. Because what you have is basically a lifelong patient, someone who will always need uh, something from you, right? So you just have, you have a permanent patient there. The second thing is also the state. Uh, the state can literally take your kids away from you. Uh, if he's diagnosed with, you know, being a girl, uh, and and you say no, that's absurd. So it, like this, this increases the power of the state. And I, and the third interest I think is just the ideologues, the people that really do believe this, who who they're not doing it out of some cynical thing. But like this for them is it's a value, it's a belief that they hold, and now they have the power to enforce it on you, to tyrannize you with their belief. And I think these three things are a real civilizational threat that, again, it's very easy to laugh at and make fun of. Um, but when we do that, we kind of miss the significance of it. I've spoken, I'm, I'm working on a story about a family who actually had this problem. The, the free market of ideas, right? Uh, this is how it actually works in, in real life. Um, I, I can't say too much because, because, I, I, like I said, I'm still working on it. But basically, a family tried to take a student out of out of a school due to this stuff and the family had uh at least two cps reports filed against them the the filers their their identities are protected for good reason because you know to prevent retaliation against a legitimate thing okay but in this case that anonymity is being weaponized against this family to intimidate them to not taking their kid out of this particular school and they suspect it might even be people who are actually part of the school that are retaliating against the parents because they volunteered to basically exit the marketplace of ideas and just take their kid and put him in a different school. Well, these people are saying, no, actually, you don't get to opt out of my worldview uh, and we will make your life a living hell if you try to. That is actually how the marketplace of ideas works in reality. Uh, it's not free. Uh, and again, this stuff, uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not as easy to, to meme about, but it's real and it's getting worse all the time. I'm hearing these stories all, all the time from, from red states, even, you know, it's not just New York and California. It's like, no, this is happening in places that are as red as any Republican state. Yeah. I have to admit, I mean, this, this makes me extra scared now that I'm, I'm a mother and just seeing what type of mimetic egregores you have on the internet and all these mind viruses that just travel freely. This is obviously, you know, you could see, you see like the mimesis that happens and the social contagion, especially among, among young girls, yeah. like this stuff travels. It, yeah. It's, 
it's real. Yeah, I know it's totally real. This, the social contagion thing is 100% real. And there's, there's a reason we don't talk about it because that in itself shows how dangerous this is. A sane country would ban this. You know, we would do what Hungary has done, codify the reality of, of two genders, uh, men, and, men and women, uh, and, that, and that they should be raised in accordance with that. Uh, because if, if we would be honest about this, we would, we would admit this, this stuff is incredibly dangerous. Uh, and, and the idea that like it's up for debate is insane. Children view people in positions of authority as like the, the givers of fact. So if your psychotic uh, LGBT, your pro LGBT teacher tells you, you know, like that the reason you're feeling a certain way is because you were born in the wrong body, there's a good chance your kid is going to actually believe that. And they come home to you and they tell you like, you know, well, the teacher said the reason I thought this is because of this. And you say that's like, you know, you laugh and you say that's absurd. Like, no, that's that's ridiculous. Kid goes back to school, tells the teacher, teacher goes to social workers and you, you see how, how this can actually escalate really quickly. So, yeah, no, fear is correct. You should be afraid of this. I am. I'm terrified of it. I have I have two kids. One you can maybe hear uh, waking up from his nap, like I said, and, and the other one is about a month old and I'm terrified of it. Yeah, it's 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 a very strange new world to to have kids in. Um, obviously, having kids is a good thing, recommended. But <laughs> I don't know, lock them up in a basement or something. <laughs> it's it's a it's a very very hard um, hard way to you know just to manage the information that they get access to. I, I I'm happy that you know my my child is also super young, so there's not even a question of him gaining access to this information. But it's it's also very hard to deal with like narratively because you know, this is, is, this is kind of the frame that we're presented with. And it's not only the frame we're presented with uh, through social media, it's already part of the state. It's like you, you blinked once and this is codified into law almost everywhere. Like they're trying to do this here as well. Like, you know, there's, there's discussions here and this is supposedly, you know, a backward <laughs> place in, in, in right. Eastern Europe. Yeah. No, it's everywhere. It's 100% everywhere. It's, it's virulent. I think that's the right word for it. And yeah, I mean, people laughed when in California, it became a crime to misgender someone in the healthcare system. Uh, because around the same time that that was codified, it became basically a parking ticket to knowingly give someone HIV. Uh, but it became p- punishable by a pretty significant fine and prison time if, as a nurse or something, you misgender someone. You know, and people laugh like, "Oh, it's kooky California." It's only California. It's, no, it's not. It's everywhere. Yeah. It, it 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 is coming to a place near you. Again, I, I talk to parents in not just red states but also deeply red communities where this is happening. And going back to the problem with Republicans, uh, usually I hear that Republicans are not helping them. That although they go on TV and they go on Fox and will you know talk about family values and crazy critical race theory and radical gender ideologies. When they actually come home to their districts and these parents are begging them for help, they don't get a return phone call. In one case, I interviewed a family. It was in a district where they had these issues with literature, like these books that depict what is basically graphic gay sex uh, between adolescents. And they found these books in Texas at middle schools. Uh, And not the first time either. And parents there are so angry that they're pushing for actually uh, prosecuting school administrators that bring these books into classrooms, which I think is fantastic. Of course, that, that would horrify, right, liberals and reasonable uh, classical liberals. But that, I mean, like, this is actually what we need to do. That's, act, that's the only way to stop this kind of thing. But anyways, the, the point is, is that this is, these are deeply red communities in red states, and they're dealing with it. And they're being tyrannized by, by libs, whatever you want to call them, progressives. Uh, and, and almost no one is helping them. They're helping themselves through community action. Uh, I interviewed a couple of parents that actually ended up getting arrested uh, in Texas uh, in what seems to be like a retaliatory action by a school district that has its own police force. So, yeah, no, it's real. Oh, Jesus. It's totally real. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I realized this stuff was real because, I mean, the thing is you don't really have it codify it in law now. 
but it is in the minds of people. It comes in through the screens and it takes, takes over from the inside. And then you have like, for example, uh, kind of people of my generation now, um, very invested in the European Union for, for partly for good reason here in Romania, because there's been a lot of improvements since we've joined the EU. Um, but they're also invested in the, the spirit that's coming from the European Union. And this, this is all, DEI. It's all diversity, inclusion. You know, Black Lives Matter is a thing here. Yeah. Literally no Black people. You know, even we, we have some ethnic conflict here, but it does not map completely onto Black Lives Matter, but it's still that's still the the, the, the recipe that you get. It's, it's, yeah. it's absurd. Yeah. So, yeah, I can see I can see it creeping in slowly and yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, it is what it is. You know, just to answer the question of why I'm interested in this stuff, why I talk to the people at the source. That, and that that is always a kind of um that is always a kind of tactical move that people make to get you to not care. Well, why do you care? You live in like Texas or you live in Romania. It's not there. And it, it is. Or, you know, it it starts to creep in and people will say, Well, that you know, that stuff is it's not it's, it's never going to take root here. And it does. It's, it's a kind of tactical indifference or a tactical ignorance. You see it in places like Idaho, where people right now are organizing on the right to purge the, the Idaho GOP of, of lame Republicans and, and get some fighters in government. And the response from the GOP establishment, and also from like left media, because of course they don't, they don't want that, uh, is like, well, what's, what's all the hubbub? You know, like stuff, this is Idaho, man. This is, it's, you know, it's deep red here. This stuff's never going to happen here. Let's let's all just calm down and you know focus on our shared values, and then five years later, uh, it it will be there in full force. You know, like that's exactly how this stuff spreads. It's like I said, a kind of tactical indifference or tactical ignorance to it. And a lot of the stuff is the re- well. The reason I said I'm sorry is because a lot of this stuff is a, a U.S. import. Uh, the thing that we import the most is this this these ideologies and. Uh, it's interesting that France has actually, of all of all the countries, France actually picked up on this, and I think Macron even said pretty much explicitly that this stuff is coming from the United States, like Black Lives Matter. Um, and there's a French thinker, his name, I think his last name is Tanguif, and supposedly uh, Macron reads him very carefully, and uh, very similar thesis that this woke stuff that is now international originated in the United States, and it has now become a kind of ideological export. And uh, the French consider it a kind of like national security threat because it has the potential. This is, again, goes back to how useless like right liberals are, right? The French look at this and like, yeah, no, this is a national security threat. This threatens to destabilize the regime because these ideas strike at the very heart of who we are as the French that being French is bad and racist, and that therefore French society must be revolutionary, revolutionarily transformed, which is exactly what the stuff in America says, right? Uh, and the French are like, this is a huge problem. Uh, again, national security threat. And we're like, no, it's fine. It's just a, dis- just, just a disagreement of ideas. Exactly. We need to, we need to let the, the, the marketplace work, it, work itself out. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really... <laughs> It's a, it's unfortunate. I think in Romania, the, the kind of the lucky situation that we have is that we're we're so kind of backward compared to to Europe proper that it's very hard for us to see uh, ourselves as white <laughs> in any in any yeah. They're, we're very confused because we're very poor. There are many countries that that you know have different you know color schemes and are doing better than us. So the stuff stuff has got to give the whole Black Lives Matter stuff doesn't really map onto the situation that well. You're, you're still trying to figure out who the people of color are in Romania. Exactly. <laughs> and who, then turn who them into the are the Nazis and who are the Jews? I need yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah. And then base your entire politics on the grievances of the the designated POCs and then destabilize Romanian society until there is a a drag queen story hour in every in every library. Yeah, I'm sure this will happen within the next two years somehow. Um, this was really good. Before I let you go, I want to ask you the the question of the show. Everyone gets asked this question. Um, do you have a a thinker? It could be a writer, politician, um, living or dead, that you think is underrated and that people should be more interested in? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to break the rule and, and say two, but I think they have to, they have to be mentioned together because they you have to read them together to understand the significance of both of them. I think 
uh, James Burnham and his best is his greatest disciple, Sam Francis, both dead. Uh, Burnham is most famous for probably the managerial revolution, uh, lesser so for the suicide of the West. Uh, but I think his, his most important book is the Machiavellians, which that method, the, the, the Machiavellian methodology, uh, that is how I approach pretty much everything. Uh, and the, so the significance of San Francis is, is that he took Burnham and then kind of applied this innovation, which is that liberalism, modern liberalism is the vehicle by which the managerial regime in whatever country uh, grows. That, that it's a kind of a mechanism for, for the spread and growth and consolidation of power uh, of managerialism. And so Burnham kind of introduces you to, the, I think that the original uh, subheading of his book was what is happening in the world of the managerial revolution. So that, so he, it's literally that it's a kind of introduction to, you know, what managerialism is. Machiavellian's is, is, is a kind of like expose of Burnham's thought and approach. And then reading San Francis, you see how modern liberalism and managerialism have kind of integrated and benefit from each other. He never wrote a sustained treatise of his thought. Uh, there's a work that was published after his death called Leviathan and its Enemies. When you read it, you can tell it's kind of rough because he never got a chance to edit it. Um, it's good if you're, if you're familiar with his work, but if you, if, you, if you just jump into that, you'll probably hate it because it's, it's re- it's, I think it's, a, it's actually a tremendously good book, but it's just so theoretical and kind of repetitive uh, that you, you miss the flavor of why, why St. Francis was so effective which is that he was a very witty and, and powerful writer. And probably the best place to see that is Beautiful Losers. It's a collection of his essays. And although, again, he never says, you know, this is my method, you can kind of see the method on display in Beautiful Losers. Uh, essays on the failures of American conservatism. Uh, one book that's even better than that by him is uh, Revolution from the Middle, although copies are super hard to find. So I would just recommend for Burnham, Managerial Revolution, Machiavellians, and for St. Francis, The Beautiful Losers. I'm, I'm smiling because I, I'm literally now reading uh, Leviathan and its, and its enemies uh, as a start to my journey to San Francis. And I feel like you've just given me a tutorial of what not to do because I'm reading it like while I'm, you know, it's, it's a whole complicated thing in the dark, trying to not wake the baby. And it is pretty heavy, I have to say, like incredible how you're reading my mind now. So I will I will transition to Beautiful Losers and circle back yeah. once I, <laughs> I got him. I think even in the preface, someone says to that book that it's just, it's Sam that is most theoretical. Uh, it doesn't have the the, the wit and the the pithiness and because because he was he was a very literary writer um it, it very much influenced my style uh and you don't have that it um leviathan is really it's it's a work of political theory uh so i like i said that's why it helps to read his other stuff and then you come to that and you're like okay i'm ready for this and i, I kind of have an uh, an understanding of who he is and how he works so yeah excellent it's also just fun to read because he's he's a fantastic uh polemicist yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I think I, I read one essay of his just kind of on the internet and I was like, okay, yeah, this is a good a good next step for me. I remember you mentioned him. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, I, I think I've also, I've also added, because I have a kind of this running list of like post-liberal literature that people can check out because people keep asking me like, what is this? What, what, what should we read? And Burnham's obviously part of that. Uh, yeah. so yeah, I am going to add more, more San Francis on there. Um, yeah, this is really fun. Thank you so much, Pedro. This is, uh, this has been a long time coming. I wanted to have you on for, for a long time, but now with the, with the, all the scandal, I feel like it's, it's extra spicy that you've, <laughs> you've been yeah. on. Um, I want people, uh, to go to your Twitter, um, at Pedro Gonzalez. It's at E-M-E-R-I-T-I-C-U-S. Oh, yes, exactly. Exactly. You have a, an, an interesting uh, twist <laughs> twist on it. it. It's a play on the word uh, Aramite, which is an, a word for hermit. Oh. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it, it, just, it's, it, has, it actually goes back to the, to the hermit tarot card, but uh, I should probably change it to just my name, but I, I, I don't know. It's become, it's become identified with me, so I don't think I can, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's good. I, I remembered it before, but for some reason now it's, uh, you know, <laughs> like Emeriticus. Yeah. Emeriticus, exactly. Um, and to your Substack. Contra.substack.com. Exactly. And to Chronicles. 
chroniclesmagazine.org. I would highly recommend a subscription there. Uh, every subscription allows us to remain ind- uh, independent so that I can report on the, like the stuff that I talked about with regards to like transgenderism and things like that. So wonderful. So subscribe to Contra and subscribe to Chronicles, <laughs> guys. Thank you so much, Pedro. Thank you.